My name is Steven Zamora. I'm also starting the second year of my MPH in Epidemiology over at San Diego State University, uh, where I also got my undergrad in um, Microbiology. The project I'm working on is called Disaggregating Cancer Mortality Burden by Hispanic Ethnicity. So I was, um, all my research was done at San Diego State University at a time-shared office with one of the um, doctors down there, with one of the professors. So she let me use her office for the summer, so I pretty much spent most of the day in a small office on the computer looking at Excel, SAS, and all those great things, you know, true epidemiology. Um, but yeah, so before we get into disaggregated um, burden, what do we know about aggregate Hispanics? So we know that cancer is the leading cause of death among the Hispanic population, and it's actually the second cause of death among non-Hispanics whites. So it's a major priority, and it's why we're all here today. Uh, overall, incidence of mortality rates are decreasing in the Hispanic community, which is great. Uh, cancer is more likely to be ca caught at later stages when compared to non-Hispanic whites. Uh, this really affects health outcomes because if you catch cancer as a late, later stage, you're more likely to die from it. Um, so for men, prostate cancer had the highest incidence and lung cancer had the highest death rate. Uh, breast cancer had both the highest incidence and death rates in Hispanic women. So the Hispanic community actually faces a lot of unique risks and disparities. Um, for example, there's obstacles to screening such as poverty, education, access, language, and health literacy. Uh, some startling facts, so 25% of Hispanics lived in poverty and 37% were completely uninsured. Obesity is also more prevalent in Hispanics. I think the last figure I checked said Hispanics are 40% uh, obese. This really are overweight or obese, so this really affects their cancer burden when it comes to CRC or breast cancer. Um, however, despite all these things, lower cancer burden, um, we see lower a lower cancer burden. This is what is actually known as the Hispanic paradox, and I think it's really interesting. Um, there are a lot of different theories and research that has been put in the Hispanic paradox. Uh, one of them being um, has to do with the impact of acculturation and time in the U.S. Um, so, for example, um, a recent study showed that foreign-born Hispanics have less cancer mortality, and they're actually driving this lower cancer burden that we see. However, um, I just talked to some colleagues, and they've done a, another um, study, this one involving heart disease, but they actually found the opposite. They found higher heart disease in foreign-born Hispanics than Hispanics born here. So, as any good paradox, this is shrouded in kind of a lot of mystery and needs a lot more questions. So here's a little bit um, of the breakdown of the Hispanic populations. So in my study, I looked at all states combined, Florida, California, and New York. Uh, so rates can vary depending on the data you're looking at, but in the United States, about 16 to 70% are Hispanics. Mexicans making up about 10% of that. Notice in California how almost 40% of California are Hispanic, but 30% of that um, um, are Mexican. So they're really going to drive that all Hispanic rate down there. Also in Florida, Cubans are actually the number one Hispanic populations, and uh, Puerto Ricans in New York. But what's also interesting, when I first made this slide, I just focused on Cubans, Puerto Ricans, and Mexicans. There's also an, an, another category called other Hispanics, which includes a lot of Central and South Americans. And if I were to actually include these on these slides, in Florida and New York, they would actually be Cubans and Puerto Ricans. That was interesting. And, you're, and that's going to be interesting when we look at trends later. Um, Hispanics are the largest minorities, minority group in the U.S. and they're rapidly growing, which is why detailed cancer burden is a priority. And it also gets into why we should disaggregate. So aggregation of Hispanic ethnicity, mass important findings and trends. This is due to a number of reasons. One could be um, just the distribution of Hispanics. Two, so all the disparities I mentioned, they can be different for each Hispanic race. For example, the smoking prevalence in Cubans could be different um, than the smoking prevalence in um, Mexicans. Also, um, socioeconomic level can be different throughout the strata. Um, so actually, uh, studies assessing cancer in incidence and mortality in Florida found that each subgroup of Hispanics had a distinct cancer profile. So because each of the cancer stories um, for each Hispanic subgroup are different, I believe that the targeted program should also be different if we ever want to lower the burden. So this kind of brings me to my, my project. Uh, so the aims of this project was essentially to make age-adjusted mortality rates, proportional cancer mortality, and SMRs 
for um, all states combined for the states I've mentioned uh, for each of the ethno ethnicities in the states that I talked about. Um, and so the way where we got our data was from the National Center for Health Statistics. And like I said, we analyzed data for all states and separately for Florida, New York, and California. Um, so the information was pulled from death certificates, actually. And I was actually really fortunate. So when I received the data, it was already de-identified, stratified into their states and their cancer sites, and I received it from um, my colleagues over in Stanford. It was a large amount of data. I believe there were over 2 million um, death certificates uh, for um, non-Hispanic rights and over 150,000 for the Hispanics. Um, so after these rates are calculated, we wanted to uh, analyze the trends and we used joint point regression analysis. And then all the data analysis was done using SAS and figures were made in Excel. Um, it's important to note that for the trends, any year with any year for a cancer site that had a cancer site of less than 11 death counts, we had to remove because the trend was unstable. And then also information from uh, census 2010 data were used, was used for um, our age adjusted mortality rates and for the um, adjustments. Which actually is going to bring us into some of the results of my project. We're going to get into the rates. So this is just rates um, at a glance with pooled Hispanic um, mortality data. On the left, you see information I got from the American Cancer Society, a study they did. And on the right, you see our data. Um, so I kind of, I really like this slide because it's kind of like a reassurance for me. Like I'm, I'm pretty new to uh, SAS and, and calculating age adjusted mortality rates in SAS is pretty complicated. So looking at this, you can see that uh, the, the rates are pretty comparable. For, for a lot of ours, the, the rates are higher. Um, do you remember when I said overall cancer mortality trends are decreasing? Our study started in 2003, so we expect more deaths to be in for the 2003, the 2003 to the 2008 years, whereas this study only started in 2008. So we are going to have more deaths than ours, which is totally fine. Um, so just looking at rates at a glance, the trends follow what we would expect, with lung being highest in MAUs for non-Hispanic rates and for, um, and for Hispanics. Um, let's see, and then of course, highest for women in prostate. So now I believe we're going to dive in. Okay, so now we're going to go into the MAL top cancer sites by state. So here's all states combined. And what's important to know about the, um, these percents is that they're ratios and they're not adjusted. So age is going to come into, into play when we take a look at these. So just as, as a glance, we see in non-Hispanic rates, we have lung being one and prostate being two. For all the other um, Hispanic ethnicities, this isn't true except for Cubans. Cubans has lung number one and prostate being number two. And what I found in a lot of the um, results is that the Cubans trends reflect a lot of the non-Hispanic white trends, which, is, which sets them apart different from their Hispanic counterparts. Um, prostate being number two isn't so surprising. Um, so prostate cancer deaths are, it's a large, it's a, it's a it's largely due to age. It's a slow-growing cancer, um, so we so pretty much older gentlemen are going to be the ones dying from it. Um, and the reason why we might see it less and lower, so we don't even see it here in the Mexican um, population. That might be because the population in the United States it's younger. So because these aren't adjusted for by age, um, age goes into a factor there. So here it is broken down for California. Um, we kind of, so these sometimes jump around a lot. We've seen, I th believe we just saw stomach cancer pop up for Puerto Rican and other Hispanics in California, um, w which makes sense. We're going to see a higher version, higher um, can infectious cancers in, our, in the Hispanic population. And then going on to the next slide. Okay, so this is New York. What was really interesting about these ratios for New York was leukemia popped up to number two for Mexicans. Now, I actually had a chance to um, talk to um, someone who is really well-versed and really well-studied in the field, a Dr. Paulo Pen Penero, and he, he's actually doing um, a study in New Mexico, and from what he told me, the Mexican population there is really young, which, why, which is why we probably see this jump in leukemia down there in, in New York. Yeah. And then here is Florida. 
Um, what did I notice about Florida? Yeah, so the thing about my project is I was like, I had a lot of different states, a lot of different cancers, so sometimes like some of them get mixed up in my head, but we'll, we'll see as we go along. We saw prostate jumped up for Puerto Rican, other Hispanics, and for Cubans, so that's interesting. But yeah, so these are the rates I calculated for the mills. I think next we're actually going to get into the adjusted rates. Yeah, so these are the age adjusted mortality rates per 100,000 for mills. So now, because everything's age adjusted, we saw prostate cancer move up to number two. So this is assuming that the population has a similar age distribution. This is why we're going to see that jump in prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. um, so basically what I want to point out is that trend, uh, the rates kind of match what we expect with liver cancer being highest in the um, Hispanic populations, all except for Cubans, but they didn't make the board there. And then these are also, these have also been done. Oh, also pay attention to these lung uh, rates up here. So it's highest in non-Hispanic rates, which we expect, lowest in Mexicans, which is also we expect, but look how high it is for Cubans. It's, it's closer to the non-Hispanic whites than it is for Mexicans. And then keep your eye out on the Puerto Rican trends as we go to the state, through the states. So in California, the trends kind of match what we've seen on the slide before. Same thing for Florida. And then take a look at for New York. We, I, I think we see a major jump in lung cancer mortality for Puerto Ricans here. Right? It's pretty close to the Cuban calculation, to the Cuban rate far from the Mexican rate, and once again, closer to the non-Hispanic whites rates. So this is kind of what I was leaning towards. When we look at each different Hispanic ethnicity separately, their, uh, their uh, burden trends are different. Cancer mortality trends are different. So now we're going to look at females. I might go through these pretty fast, because for the most part, they just fall in line with what we would expect, and there's not a lot of changes. So when it comes to all states combined for non-Hispanic rights, once again, it's um, lung cancer deaths that are highest, um, and then breast cancer for all um, Hispanic ethnicities, with lung being second. As you can imagine, um, smoking prevalence is higher with the non-Hispanic rights and then lower within the Hispanic ethnicities, but as we see, that's not true for all of them. Things get a little bit more interesting. So yeah, for, when we break it down by state, there's no real difference, I'm just going to go ahead and go through them. But we do see a little bit more interesting when everything is age adjusted. Or actually, we're going to see something more interesting when we get to the rate ratio. So I might go through these pretty fast too. But once again, when it comes to the top um, age adjusted AMRs per 100,000, we do see these jumps in Puerto Ricans and other Hispanics when it comes to all states. But other than that, trends fall in line with what we've seen previously. I'm going to go ahead and do these pretty fast for the interest of time. So now we're going to get into the selected rate ratios, which are so directly age adjusted. Got it. So basically, when I looked at my rate ratios, I thought it was a good idea just to pull out the highest one for each uh, different state strata and each different um, sex that I saw. For example, for all states and mall, the highest rate ratio I saw was 2.3 in Puerto Rican. For females, it was for um, it was for stomach cancer, and it was in Mexicans. And then we can see Cubans having pretty much uh, rate ratios of one, which is not supporting. Oh, by the way, so the reference group for these rate ratios are non-Hispanic whites. So for, essentially, the Cubans are no different from non-Hispanic whites uh, when it comes to these cancers. And for California, we just see that the rate ratio is now uh, jumped up to stomach. Um, but there's one. And we do see actually um, a protective, I have to check this actually, but we see a protective rate ratio of 0.41 for Puerto Ricans. Mm -hmm. I think that's in there accidentally actually, so it doesn't make sense. We were adjusting slides because we did want to try to include the um, protective rates, but we decided we didn't have enough time for that but one still found their way in there. Yeah, 
I may have to check that one. This Florida. Okay, so this is something I found, this is the highest rate ratio I saw, and I thought it was pretty alarming. So in New York, the highest rate ratio I saw was in Puerto Ricans, and it was a rate ratio of 3.2. This means that Puerto Ricans are three times as more likely to die from liver cancer than their non-Hispanic white counterparts, which I thought was alarmingly high. All right, and then I don't believe we included the, oh, you saw the females on the bottom. Yeah. So that's it for the rates. We're gonna get into the, what I personally think is like the most interesting part of my um, research experience, which is the trends. I only included a few of the trends. I've done trends for each sex and for each cancer site, but I only did like include the like two for the sake of time. So the trends were made from 2003 to 2012. This is for lung cancer mortality. And as I said before, um, especially when it comes to lung cancer, we see more mortality decreasing. Wherever you see one of these little stars, it shows that trend was significant. If you don't see that star, that means there's not enough statistical evidence in the data to show that's not different from a straight line. So we see decreasing, significant decreasing trends when it comes to all states. For all Hispanic ethnicities, so Cubans, Puerto Ricans, but all Hispanics combined in Mexicans, but we don't see it for other Hispanics. And there's a key down there. Yeah. So we see across the board lung cancer just decreasing. And then I also included this next slide because I thought it was, oh, I included females too. And this kind of just goes to show you um, the contrast. Females smoke, at least for the Hispanic, for um, Hispanics, female Hispanics smoke far less than male um, Hispanics. For when it comes to non-Hispanic whites, male and females, it used to be females used to smoke less, but I've actually heard that there's, it might be shifting the other direction now. Um, but yeah, as you can see, uh, when it comes to lung cancer, uh, female smoke are have uh, lower rates of lung cancer deaths. And so I think a big takeaway from these results is the increases in lung cancer that we're seeing. So when, it, when we're looking at all states combined, we see significant increases in one Puerto Ricans, uh, two, two Mexicans when all Hispanics are combined, and then I don't think this trend is, might, might be borderline significant when it comes to Cubans. So this strong increase in um, liver cancer mortality is pretty alarming, and I know there's a lot of um, research that's being put in that right now. So that's essentially, I believe that's, oh, and then I included females too. But actually when it comes to California, we see a few interesting um, increases in female liver mortality, especially when it comes to Mexicans, so that's pretty interesting. So basically, from um, that's what my project fo focused on, modeling trends and calculating all these different rates. I know it's a lot of different numbers and it's a lot to go through, and it was a lot for me too, just kind of like, okay, which do I pull out to, to tell a really um, significant story? Um, but that was essentially it. Um, when it comes to death certificate data, misclassification is probably the number one limitation. Um, there's, there's a lot of debate, actually, do you remember that Hispanic paradox I talked about? Um, it used to be, there was a theory going around that it might be that those lower rates that we see in Hispanics is due to actually misclassification and, and under-reporting of the death count. <laughs> Studies have been done um, to follow up on that to show actually that's not the case, uh, but it, it's interesting to see the conversation there. Small cell counts in some of the ethnicities. Um, so like, like I said before, some of the trends with two small death counts, uh, we're gonna have to adjust for those later. And then there's possible underreporting death counts due to migration of six older his Hispanics. So Hispanics who might want to return to their um, country of origin when they die, we're not going to necessarily pick those up on the death certificates. So there's undercounting there. Uh, future directions and projects. So we're likely going to include Texas. I don't know why we didn't include Texas from the very beginning. Uh, oversight, probably. Um, but actually, Thursday when I get back, uh, we're, I'm probably going to uh, contact my colleagues over at Stanford and ask them for the Texas data. And as I was saying before, SMRs and two to three year trends to address small cell sizes. So essentially we're going to collapse a few of the years in order to make the trends more stable for ones where we had to exclude them. Uh, potential ideas for future CIS fellows. 
we actually have county level data, so it might be interesting to just do some GIS um, um, analysis with these data, which I think would be really interesting. Um, learning experience and career goals. So I feel like I've done a lot of advanced SAS procedures in data managing. Yeah, I had a year of SAS, a year of SAS experience before, but I, yeah, so those uh, AMRs and those adjusted rates were not easy to do, so that was a lot of fun. And I also got to communicate among collaborators. Uh, a lot of PA, PIs, a lot of people with their PhDs, a lot of ideas coming at me. So just being in that environment, I felt like was really interesting and really opened my eyes to kind of the, word of, the world of academia. Um, project development, as we all have, and exposure to the publishing process. And then, um, so I believe those, in addition to what a lot of my other CIS fellows says, are kind of learning experience I took out of it. Uh, now, goals I have um, personally is I want to continue research with special populations. I've always had a, a heart for the disadvantaged and health disparities, so I'd love to continue going into that. Uh, possibilities. I know Dr. Chamberlain and I, we had a good conversation about clinical trials that really interested me, and I think that matches my uh, more uh, microbiology um, undergrad background. So I think that would be really interesting if I can get into studies with that. I, I also really like data managing, so looking through all those data sets, doing the SAS, it's kind of like a puzzle to me. So it was actually a lot of fun when it worked out. Um, and then PhD, someday, um, I, I'm really passionate about special populations, like I said. I kind of want a year's work experience first, but I think PhD is definitely on my radar, radar now when it really wasn't before. So these are, um, um, here's a list of mentors and co-authors that um, helped me throughout the project. And then of course thank you to Steve, uh, Dr. Chamberlain and Dr. Solomon um, for all your help. And then, so I realized when I, when I looked at, for, for strengths of my site, I thought it was just kind of strengths of the um, research. But strengths for my um, site specifically, um, the mentor, Dr. Thompson, she has done amazing in helping me learn and develop. Um, and plus the data set that we have, it's really huge, but I feel like it's really complete. So there's a lot of different things we could look at. So that was good strength. Um, and th throughout the process, I actually got to go over to the Stanford area and meet with my team. And just that experience of presenting for them and getting a lot of feedback from them, I felt like that was a strength as well, really exposing me to academia, like I was saying. So here are my references. And then this is kind of like the Thompson Lab over the summer. So there's me, there's a PhD student in the undergrad. We are kind of there at our desk on a computer for eight hours a day, just bouncing ideas off each other. So that was pretty fun. And then this is for my trip for, for Stanford. Um, so we have colleagues over at the Cancer Prevention Institute of California. Uh, I believe that's over there by San Jose. And then this is me on top of Stanford. They have this really cool elevator that goes all the way up. And you can see like a 360 view. And then this is um, a picture of their, uh, they have a really nice cathedral there. Um, so yeah, so that was pretty fun. I believe that is it, so thank you all for your time. Thank you, Stephen. Questions? Yeah, I have Well, there are probably, many, many of you are wondering about the admixture population. Yeah. That, um, certainly if you went to Texas and you you had to classify pure Hispanics, mm -hmm. that would be very, very difficult. Um, yeah. And you probably would be limited to those who migrated more recently mm -hmm. because Hispanics have been in Texas for several hundred years. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think the data we have right now, if, if they did mention sort of admixture, like they checked two boxes on the death certificate, yeah. I don't believe they were included. But it would be really interesting, because I know there's a lot going on in the admixture population. So if you look at that, that'd be great. Right. Dr. Wilson. Have you thought much about interpreting these results? Um, presented us with a, a lot. A lot of numbers, right? A lot of numbers, a lot of trends. Okay, yeah. Trends, some of which are statistically significant. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're dealing with is cancer deaths. Yeah. So deaths due to different cancers. Exactly. We've all got to die of something, so there might be competition here. Definitely. Um, but, but, but also, um, what, what goes into that includes not just getting the cancer, all those risk factors, but also not being treated for those cancers. Mm -hmm. So, surviving and dying. Yeah. So, 
help us with interpreting some of these results. Yeah, so what you said is exactly right. So the cool thing about mortality, it, it's really good at measuring burden because one, it relies on getting the disease. Two, it, survivorship goes into play. So you look at both when you look at mortality. Um, when it comes to as far as reasons, I haven't had much time to research individual reasons that go into play, and I, I really want to. Um, but actually, a colleague emailed me a paper after seeing this lung cancer trend. Yeah. And um, so what we saw, if or sorry, not lung cancer, liver cancer, this increase in liver cancer, and we were shooting out a bunch of ideas for this over at in Stanford. One of them we believed it might have to do uh, due to toxins found in bacteria on corn. Um, but the paper I read, it essentially saw that when it came to cancer, cancer mortality, it was two times higher in the U.S. born than foreign born. That's what the paper was looking at. So this might go into the factors I mentioned before. So we know it's suspected that cancer risks increases with acculturation and with time spent in the U.S. This could be this is likely to adoption of behaviors such as drinking. Um, so so yeah, that's my personal interpretation of liver cancer mortality. Um, there's, there's a lot, everything is multifactorial, right? So it's kind of hard to pin it on one thing. But yes, that's my opinion that it is for liver cancer. Especially after reading that paper, it's pretty interesting. Any other? Yeah. So there was a lot of similarities, a lot of similarities between the Cuban and the um, non Hispanic white. whites. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was trying to think like what, what could be the differences between the Cubans and the other uh, Hispanics, and uh, do you think it could be like uh, just a culture agent in general, and the, the amount of time that they've been in the U.S. in general? Maybe that was an idea of mine. I haven't done the research to see how long Cubans have been in the U.S. associated to the other ethnic groups, uh, but maybe. But we also know that Cubans are kind of are known for the Cuban cigars. Right? We were talking about this earlier, uh, so that might be why their trends are more similar when it comes to lung cancer. Uh, but yeah. Um, I think so. Definitely, when I when I start the paper, I do have to sit down and think about. Okay, we see these trends. What what's a, what's an explanation or two that might go into it? Yeah. Along these lines, I uh, thinking about uh, articles that really impressed me because they were interesting or unique. Uh, many years ago, I was in cardiovascular disease prevention when I was on the faculty at. Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, and uh, there there was a paper about um, African Americans who migrated to San Francisco, but they migrated from the southeastern part of the United States early in life. They had the same uh, rates of cardiovascular disease of. African Americans who had remained in the southeastern part of the United States. And they were very different than African Americans who had spent all their lives in California. Mm -hmm. And so it's this principle of, you know, do you, do you carry, uh, you know, genetic characteristics from one part of the country to another? Do you carry uh, food preferences and lots of other behaviors? from one part of the country to another. Yeah. Obviously, these African Americans who migrated early in life migrated with their parents. And so they had southeastern US parents, although they lived in San Francisco. Uh, so it raises these questions about areas of origin yeah. and with the genetic pool from those areas, as well as the social epidemiology mm -hmm. that you bring with you. Yeah. And I can kind of um, lend to that. I just wrote a paper looking at stroke, looking at African Americans, or just blacks in general. Well, it's stratifying by place of origin, whether it's from Africa, the Caribbean, whether they're US born. And you actually find that the you're not seeing the same trends, or you're, you're not seeing the same risks for stroke that you're seeing for blacks from the US, you're not yeah. seeing those same things within blacks from Africa, or even, or it looks different in blacks from the Caribbean depending on age. So, yeah, we, there's a lot of, and that's hard because, right, all our data sets, we, 
when we're doing these secondary data analysis, we just don't have access to the data, to that um, kind of data that you know looks down into that much detail. Yeah. And so we're kind of forced to aggregate everything when it's very misleading. And we also mm -hmm. know that by um, concluding racial disparities where really they're not, you're actually um, enforcing it, yeah. right? Like you can do a lot of damage by burdening one um, racial group or ethnic group and saying, oh, they're always this, they're always this, they're always that. Yeah. So, yeah, yep, we have to be session. very careful. Like, they're really low across the board. Like, we don't want to say, like, oh, this person has 100 times the death kind of dying of this one, but it's really, it's just, like, the numbers are like that because they're low. Yeah. Yeah. So, you yeah, have yeah. to be careful with that, definitely. And I think also, like, for, for future work, I think it would probably be really interesting to do, like, work maybe in, like, with a microbiologist on, like, like the uh, microbiome and like gut flora and that you know, we've had a lot of that established at a really young age to see the differences in, in the gut flora of people that like say uh, Hispanic born mm -hmm. or uh, American, US born Hispanics versus like their parents who may be from yeah. born and see like differences in gut flora and see if that affects. Really interesting, especially considering yeah. the stomach cancer burden on the Hispanic population. Like, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen.